Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoy the film. And we are now ready for what will hopefully be a stimulating discussion. We have a few people who will provide some responses, comments, and who contextualize the film. And we start with responses from teachers who will tell us how their experiences depicted, how the experiences depicted in the film resonate with them and um, in their everyday work. And um, we start with Dr. Paul Murray. Uh, Paul is, teacher, is a teacher at Karkodi High School and he's a leader of their award-winning LGBT plus students group. Paul. Well, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Sorry, folks, I've got a mixing desk next to me and I always forget that it's got a fader on it. Um, yeah. Yes, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be speaking to you all. Um, Edgar, are you just wanting a comment from me about how it resonates with my own experiences or experience I've heard kind of from other teachers? Yeah, that's fine. So um, first of all, I thought it was comedy just seeing everything in Patterson's Land and Murray House because that's where I did my training. So I was kind of constantly going, oh, that's that place. Um, so I enjoyed that. But uh, but yeah, there was a there were a bunch of things that resonated with sort of various experiences I've had. Um, one of the first things that I spotted was this business of um, in teaching you have to have a thick skin. That's quite a common little phrase that you hear, and not specifically LGBT related. But I just thought it's an interesting phrase um, to consider. In that, um, do we want teachers with thick skins? Do you want teachers that are sort of hard nosed bastards teaching kids? And I'm not convinced by that myself. I think it's a really interesting phrase that gets banded about a lot. And I'm actually not convinced that thick, uh, a sort of uniformed army of thick skinned people is what we really want up in front of children. But I just thought it was interesting that phrase was in there. Um, so I actually came out the first time to a group of kids. So I have had the experience of being asked in the classroom and that was actually my first experience of coming out to a group of people other than myself. Um, but in my school, um, I actually resonated a lot with the sort of super enthusiastic teacher if every school was my school. Um, that had a lot of resonance for me because that is actually quite what my school is like. Um, it is a very open place. It is a very diverse place. It's a place where diversity is celebrated. Um, and when I came out and I'm visibly out in the classroom, then I, I've never had any fears of that ever being a problem or my job being in jeopardy or even the kids would bully me or anything like that which is never the, the sort of environment and the ethos in my school and um, just never made me feel for, fearful of that and it's never been a problem the interesting thing that did happen to me um though was again not specifically lgbt related but i think it it resonated another phrase and um, was that teaching can be a very conservative profession conservative with a small c of course um and I have had some experience of that, not to do with sexuality, but actually more to do with the fact that I look quite different. Uh, I've got long hair and a braid and I can address very colorful way and I tend to be quite sort of slightly flamboyant. And, uh, and I remember being told that there had been chats amongst the teachers when they first encountered me that I wasn't gonna last five minutes because the, the parents and the kids would just never weather this weird kind of hippie teacher that they had on their hands. And um, but that obviously turned out not to be the case. So I, I have experienced the sort of teaching can be um, very conservative, but but not specifically to do with um, LGBT. Um, I thought the comment on location was really interesting. Um, I think there was one point and someone was commenting that I think they taught in a more affluent school and those kids were sort of exposed to more and they were there for more accepting. I thought that was really interesting. I've almost had got the opposite experience of that. Um, I teach in a school that has quite a high proportion of free school meals, a lot of poverty in the catchment. And um, the head teacher actually made a comment to me on one occasion that the LGBT kind of group and all the stuff we'd done had been so successful. And he said, it's almost as if the, the parents and the kids in our school, they've got bigger fish to fry. They've got more things to worry about. Um, they're, they're worried about like the bailiffs turning up to take the TV away rather than whether you're gay or anything like that. So maybe that's one of the reasons that we've actually been quite so well integrated in my school. And I thought that was really interesting. So it's almost like the kind of opposite of what was being said there. Because I, I do teach in sort of, I say, quite a school with a high, high degree of free school meals. 
Um, is there anything else? Uh, yeah, the, they always blame the teacher. I wrote that down. I just thought that was another interesting phrase. That phrase is being banded about at the moment over COVID and um, the, the possibility that if there's a COVID outbreak in the school, then the teachers will get the blame first for not following the rules properly or whatever. And I thought it was interesting that phrase appeared in the, in the movie as well, because I say that's been banded about a lot recently. So yeah, that's the sort of my brain dump through the various notes that I've made. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. It's always good to hear from from the experts by experience, and it's really it's really good to um, to have your views here. And um, I I would like now to invite David Lowridge Ellis, who has been a teacher for sixteen years and is presently a deputy head teacher of a large secondary school in the West Midlands. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, thank you, Edgar. Um, Edgar knows all this already because we did a podcast together a couple of years ago, but I, um, I'll i keep this as brief as possible. I made a list of resonances and I'm just going to keep this really succinct because I could literally be here all night. Almost everything in that film resonated with me. I started teaching in 2003, um, if, coincidentally the year that Section 28 was repealed. So I, I didn't know that you could kind of be out in the classroom for some time. And it, uh, I actually wasn't out in any form until about four or five years into my teaching career. I think it was a, uh, maybe another coincidence that I, I decided that I'd had enough and time was, you know, I'd come out in my personal life as well as professional life when I became a senior leader. And I think that gave me the confidence to do it. And I also perhaps thought subconsciously that if I came out and I was out at school, then the kids wouldn't dare mess with the assistant head teacher. So maybe there was that, that kind of thing really there that they, they couldn't really say anything. But obviously that's rubbish for the, you know, the newly qualified teachers who are just starting in the profession. Um, so obviously I've made it my mission since coming out myself, what, 11, 12 years ago, something like that, to make sure that everyone feels it's okay to be gay. So one of the resonances in the video really was that, you know, one of the teachers in that video said, you, can, you can't really teach children that it's okay to be gay if you don't believe that yourself. And I always use a variation of that when I'm doing teacher training. We, we, teach, we teach trainee teachers at my school and I always do a session early on on that. Um, I've never, the part of the film that I didn't, res that didn't resonate with me um, was because fortunately I've never had this experience. It's never, I've never really been bullied for being gay um, by the children, at least, you know, there have been a few things which have been reported on social media, which obviously counts as bullying in a way. Um, but, you know, I've, I, that's never happened to me. Um, I'm aware that it could always happen. Um, but I, with something that's kind of kept me um, as authentic as possible is thinking, I'd much rather a people say it about me than another pupil in their class. So it's almost like if I have to be the lightning rod for that kind of, that kind of language, at least it's going to bring it out into the open and that we can deal with it. I mean, the part of the film that I found the most harrowing was that teacher who, where the school, the police, the, and the parents utterly failed that teacher. And as a senior leader, you know, you, I, I can't imagine, you know, working in that kind of environment um, to sound like the, uh, the ginger teacher who I can relate to and we'll come to him in just a moment. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, what, one of the teachers on there said that they found it exhausting to be, to be in all the time. And I found that, I certainly found when I came out, I was a, I was a much more authentic teacher than I was previously. And the cognitive load of having to manage playing the pronoun game and avoiding talking about my male partner and that kind of stuff, I would just find it, you know, teaching is a mentally and physically exhausting profession as it is. And the last thing you want to do is add anything unnecessary on there. One thing I did find really interesting was how the film starts with that almost big state of the union address in the staff meeting. And it's that kind of like, I always get, because I deliver those, speeches now myself I'm always really wary of trying to sell an image 
rather than it be the reality. Um, there's an educationist called Mary Myatt, who you might have heard of, and she has a phrase which is live it, don't laminate it. And the idea that you're just going to put things up on the wall that say we're a diverse community and that kind of thing. If you're not actually living it day to day and truly embracing difference, I think that's a problem. So I, that kind of I, I, it's never happened to me. That sort of thing's never happened at my school. But I imagine that does happen at, at, at other schools. And I'll try and keep the rest brief because, as I say, I could go on all night. But. You know, the how do you tell someone he's gay thing and the working out the codes. You know, I wear a rainbow lanyard to work all day, but still the kids ask questions, you know, maybe kind of off the record things like you look a bit like Barney off how I met your mother. Um, and I'm just I'm always trying to think out, are they trying to say that I look like Neil Patrick Harris? And do they know that Neil Patrick Harris is gay? I mean, that's a flattering comparison. Don't get me wrong. I'll totally I'll totally take that. Um, but, you know, I do sometimes think they're trying to work it out. And the teacher who said that she wished she could be more butch. Um, conversely, you know, I think over the years, my dress sense at work has become increasingly flamboyant. And I think that that's intentional because, you know, I wear a lot of pinks and purples and that kind of thing. But it's really interesting because that's actually liberated some of the more, uh, should we use the term mask, um, uh, male staff, you know, the maths department historically came clad in blue and grey every day but now they even have pink day Fridays and all that kind of thing so um, you know it, it's I, I think that that really has an impact on the culture of the school the, the part of the film which I'm still not sure about in my own head how I feel about it is the teacher says choose your school carefully and I have said that to people myself but it makes me angry that I ever have to say that to somebody. It is a pragmatic thing. And if you really, I've done a lot of coaching of LGBTQ people who've gone on to become leaders. And I've like, if it's not working at your current school, find another school. But I think that's such a shame that we still have to say that really. Um, and the, the final thing really is that, you know, the teacher who's, who's um, I think she's going into a, a lift at the end. And she says, you want people to know that you have a good life. I think that's really important. And I don't mean a good life like the stereotypical kind of, you know, we're a gay couple, we don't have kids, we're always going on exciting holidays and that kind of thing. I mean, just kind of like, you know, I, I, I try to go out of my way to almost kind of bring my husband into everything and kind of say, yeah, it's like last night we just watched this Netflix box set and whatever. It's, it's, it's a good life, but it's also a, a, a kind of, um, you know, a, a very satisfying life. I think that's probably the word that I go with. Um, yeah, just just so much in that film resonated with me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments, David. I think um, it, uh, they they really highlight aspects of the film that that are very very present in many people's lives in LGBT, LGBTQ people um, in the sense that there are everyday aspects of, of life that often go unnoticed or that they can be quite subtle. And, and upon reflection, there are things that, uh, that need to be reconsidered and questioned like those, those phrases that uh, both you and Paul have uh, highlighted. So I think the, the, the film is, is quite successful in that. I think um, Anne Harris and Stacey Holman Jones have made a fantastic job in, in crafting these, these theater play uh, from, from the views, from the experiences of LGBTQ plus teachers. And um, um, I, uh, I think I think Anne and Stacy are not here. I don't see them in the in the in the participants list. So um, so just to, to contextualize the 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 film, this was this was research that was conducted uh, in Australia with with teachers there, and both Anne and Stacy. Uh, created this, this fantastic script to highlight these experiences and to show these often unnoticed aspects of everyday life. And, and I think this is um, a way in which we can use art and creative, uh, creative approaches to 
to showcase uh, research to a larger audience and to facilitate research dissemination. So I'm, I'm really happy that, that I was able to, to do that um, with, this, with this film, with this version of the, um, of the script. And uh, that, that was also part of, the, um, of a research fellowship that I, that I had with, at the Center of Creative Relational Inquiry. Uh, of which Jonathan Wyatt is director. And Jonathan is here as well tonight. And um, I, I would invite him to, to give some views about the creative relational aspect of this, of this, of this project. Great, thanks Edgar. Um, hello everybody, it's really amazing to be here to witness this premiere of this play. So just to say that, um, yeah, the, the Center for Creative Relational Inquiry is a research center at the Edinburgh, at Edinburgh University. It's, I mean, to, to, be, uh, to be kind of simple about it in a way, the, 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 the film we've just seen is a perfect example of creative relational inquiry. It's research that brings together uh, an interest in the, in, the, in the intimate close-up experience that pe people have together with the ways in which that experience can be rendered creatively or can be seen to be creative in itself. So it's about trying to bring the creative, as the name suggests, to bring the creative and the relational together in, in, in various ways. The Centre's purpose is to foster this kind of research, which broadly speaking, we would call qualitative research rather than quantitative research. It's interested in research that stays and inquires into the exp experiences that people have and so this is uh, an example of that. Um, I, I wanted to say a couple of things about this that this particular th this particular film that uh, something about the history of it which is that I, I see a comment in the um, in the comments here about it would be good to see this as a, as a stage play and um, it's had a quite a long history. So Stacey and Anne were, uh, were, the, were the research center's first visitors from, their, their, they're based in Melbourne, they came over. And uh, Edgar produced the, the, uh, the stage version of this play during their time in uh, visiting in November, 2017. And it was performed at the Storytelling Center in Edinburgh. Um, and then it, then it was also performed uh, um, at least, I, mean, I think I can think of at least a couple of other occasions, one of which was at the, a, a big European conference, qualitative inquiry conference that uh, about 300 people came to and it was performed as, as one of the keynotes, this, before, this, this play. And it feels like it's, it's had a really important life in, in the research center and, the, and, and what the center is trying to do. And I want to end just by saying, that this is uh, uh, two things. One is how this event seems to me to be an example of the kind of research that CCRI, the research center, the Center for Creative Relational Inquiry is seeking to do, which is to bring people together from, um, from, 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 the, from, the, from ac academics, from the academy to, to schools and, it, and performers and to bring people together in these kind of, to have these kinds of conversations. And the second thing is just to say that Edgar has been absolutely instrumental in this event over, and it's been in a sense building up for uh, nearly three years towards this point of, of producing this film and directing this film. And um, it's been a really amazing experience to witness Edgar working with the performers and, and the performers have done a fantastic job. Um, I, I think all the performers, or at least most performers, have also performed this as the stage play as well. Um, and so it feels like uh, Heavier Than Air has been really important in Seacry's life and in continues to have a life and continues to generate the kind of conversations that are happening now, which is amazing to witness. So thank you all for being here and thanks Edgar for all the work you've done in putting this together. Oh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for your for your words. And uh, we have already a, um, a comment here from in in the chat. So it's um, it's 
an opportunity to for all of you, all of us, to to discuss and talk about the the film and the, anything that comes to mind. The the actors, some of the actors are here as well, so feel free to to ask any questions about the process if if that is important to you. And um, um, Fiona Stanley, do you want to do you want to comment something? You, there is uh, I'm reading here in the chat. Maybe you'd like to to say something. Hi Edgar. Um, I mean I've just written it in the chat box, so hopefully people can see it in there. I realize I've got two typos. Sorry about that. That's typing quickly. Um, I think this is a really important piece of work. Um, I saw the play when it was performed. And so I think the film version is a triumph. Edgar, well done. This has been a beautiful um, um, change in genre, I guess, but the, the integrity of the piece, I think really works as a, as a film. And I, I think, you know, it's a really a beautiful piece and a really important piece. So thanks so much for doing that. And, uh, you know, it's a really interesting way of engaging with research. My um, point, I guess, and we've talked about this before, Edgar, is about the queer queernesses idea. And I think what this film does is it binarizes. There's the sort of straight people who don't get it. And then there's the trans or, or gay or lesbian teachers who are struggling in one way or another with you know the experiences that they are having in schools, whether those experiences are supported and, and, and good experiences or whether they're, and more of them in the film are, um, you know, difficulties with kids outing you or, or, you know, whatever. But I think the, the retreat that those folks are, are coming back to is the sense of then, you know, well, I can't talk about my partner or I, I wrote some quotes as I was listening, actually. Um, um, she lived alone, not that there's anything wrong with being single, but they've written you off as a crazy cat lady. If you can't share your life a little, then what kind of person are you? And that to me is a binary. There's the straight teachers who can come out in the classroom by saying, you know, my wife and I did this. And then there's the gay teachers who have to hide behind the pronoun game. But what about the people who are not partnered? What about the people for whom the normativity doesn't fit into the easy, you know, yes, I have a partner and the partner is same sex. Or, you know, it just seems to be we have erased one queerness with another. And I think... There's a real problem in this. Um, somebody else says in the film, straight teachers don't realize how out they are with their sexuality every time they mention their partner and then the do you have a boyfriend miss. I think that's really problematic because it's suggesting that the only right way to be gay or trans or lesbian is to be safely partnered and to be like that. And I think this moves us beyond a straight position, but it doesn't take us into a particularly queer place. That's all. It's almost like we come into existence through the presence of other and that a gendered other who gives significance to the way in which we are understood or read by others. I think it's about a normativity. I think it's about we're trying to push back against heteronormativity with homonormativity, but that's also problematic because it erases queernesses that aren't that don't fit neatly into uh, uh, you know one of the the letters. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, um, Fiona. Um, we have a response here from. David and oh and uh, Anne Marriott Anne would you like to to say something? <clears throat> um, hello there. Um, yeah, I'm I'm Anne Marriott. I'm the youth work manager at LGBT Scotland, and a really big part of our work is using, and I've mentioned it before, the LGBT charter, and that's um, a process that Paul and his school had gone through um, to ensure that, and Paul's school's at gold level, and that's provides an opportunity where training's delivered to all staff and tools are shared with young people. And it gives us that opportunity to really look at 
that whole range of identities so that it's not kept within just one of those acronyms, you know, it enables us to start thinking about pansexuality, asexuality, and, and to be reflective of us as learners and teachers, you know, how we need to really think about language and being a bit more inclusive. And that then needs to extend into um, the practice that we're sharing um, within the classrooms, et cetera, but also um, a big point of our work is around policy and sort of recognizing that within the, the Equality Act, with the nine protected characteristics, there can often be a gap because there's other identities that are maybe not included within that. So a really big part of our work is about creating a, an environment that enables staff to feel better supported and that it's actually named them within policy and practice. And it also enables pupils to feel that their anti-bullying policy is much more reflective of, of who they are and they can name it with what it means for them rather than fitting into an acronym that will always by default leave out key identities. Anyway, that's me. And I really love the film. I think it's got a really positive place. And I think that, you know, it's something that I know I've worked at LGBT youth for 20 years, but I feel that it's something that's been really sorely lacking um, because I've worked with a lot of teachers around the charter who are queer, but, you know, a lot of their stories were really expressed well in the film. Um, but I think I, it, it's really needed and I'm really delighted to have been here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's a, um, a really, it's a real pleasure to, to hear that from you and to see that the that the work that that you are doing in in with with your organization uh, in terms of in developing inclusive language and looking at the subtleties of of inclu inclusion that can be sometimes overlooked in wider discourses or wider narratives and um, I, I I really think that. This, this film does that as well in, in, in many respects. So, so thank you, thank you for, for your comment. Um, is, there, is there anyone else here who would like to say, say something we have here? So perhaps some of the actors or some of the people who have been involved. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, uh, as as members of the mem members of the audience, oh, I see there is a second page here. Um, okay. So um, yeah, I. So someone complimenting the the acting of uh, in the in the in the film, I think that is a an, a very interesting aspect of 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 research of how it's translated from from people's stories, people's narrated experiences, then into a theater play, and then into a film, and and I think it is. A strong, a strong resemblance, strong accuracy of of the words in which people used to this to describe their experience and how these are uh, translated into the into the film. And I remember speaking to some of the some of the actors of how some of them being LGBTQIA plus themselves feeling identified with some of the with some of the experiences narrated there um, and uh, yeah I don't know if, if any of you would like to share something about about the process about the making of, of this uh, from from theater to film um, I'm happy to 
say a little bit about that. Hello, I'm Mark, um, and I played Chris in the film, and also in the earlier incarnations that we performed um, at the Storytelling Centre at, as at the conference, as mentioned. And I think we did another one at the university as well, didn't we, Edgar? So it's, it's really interesting to, and having made the film now a little while ago, and not having been present when all of the sequences were being filmed, um, just to see the way that it's presented in this version was really interesting. And the, the kind of the different points of view that the, the, the filmmaker took, and I don't know how much that was your decision, Edgar, or a kind of joint decision between you, but um, yeah, it, it, I, I was kind of listening to the whole thing with, with New Year's tonight, um, just not having seen it or, or heard the text of it for quite some time. And uh, yeah, I really liked the choices about the different ways it was told, you know, the kind of direct to video cam moment and the, um, the more abstract um, ways in which the stories were presented. Um, it's, this was something when I first got involved in the project, I hadn't really thought about the experience of um, the vulnerability of um, queer teachers in, in I, I mean, teaching is such a vulnerable thing anyway, because I remember my father was a school teacher and I remember him talking at one point about a situation because he was also a guidance teacher of having to talk to a student about some matter, but ensuring that he was not alone with that student because that was a, a situation that left him vulnerable. And I'd never thought about that until that point, but just teaching is such a vulnerable thing anyway. For me, it's like every time you go into a classroom, you don't know what you're going to confront. And you're kind of having to improvise and riff and deal with whatever's happening in the room at that point. And then to feel extra vulnerable because there is something about you that can be picked on or picked out or used against you. Um, you know, it, it just, teaching to me is, 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 I couldn't do it. It seems like a terrifying thing to me. Um, but but it, it's just really interesting having worked on this to consider the vulnerability of the teacher in, in this situation. That's just stuff off the top of my head there for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, yeah, I do, it, it, uh, it's an interesting process to see it uh, from, from stage to the film and the decisions, I would say, it were a collaborative, a collaborative project in which actors and uh, the filmmaker and myself were all involved in making this, this putting together of the of the of the film. And uh, yeah, um, David is asking here whether it required any. Um, translation or any um, any adaptation from the Australian uh, context to Scot Scottish context, and I would say it was pretty pretty straight straightforward in the sense that some of the some of the places, locations, and details had to be changed just to make it more more um, closer to the um, to the Scottish context. But it was pretty much um, the same in in the sense of that resonant experience of being LGBTQIA plus here or or in Australia, and um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I uh, oh, I'm mindful of the time, so we have maybe time for one more and one more comment. If anyone wants to say something, we have here. Um, Jonathan is inviting us to be part of the um, 
members of the Center for Creative Relational Inquiry. So if you want to join and become a member and be more um, and be involved in projects like these or any others, please feel free to, to click the link there. And um, yeah. I see someone there in the chat. Mm, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, and thank you for the um, uh, to the staff Pride Network for to David, Katie, Robbie, Jonathan to organize for organizing this and to being um, here tonight. And this is this is going to be um, the the first one of of a series of seminars, and uh, we have the second one is coming soon. Um, it's going to be uh, on November the 11th, and it's going to be a talk on the imagined futures of older same-sex couples in Scotland, and it's going to be. Um, with Dr. Dora Jandrick, and it's 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 promising. It's it sounds like a really really interesting topic to to talk about as well. And keep an eye on the event bright page of the Staff Bright Network for for more of these seminars and other a series of events. And uh, and and thank you everyone. Thank you for for being here. Thanks, Edgar. Thanks, Edgar. Well done. Great job. Thank you.